This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get your first month for free at MUBI.com slash Royal Ocean. And the Oscar goes to... It's a clean sweep. The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Barry M. Osborne, Peter Jackson, and Fran Walsh producers. A special thanks to Peter Nelson and Ken Cammons, who were with me right from the days of bad taste to meet the feebles, which were, which were wisely overlooked by the Academy. When he was 16, Peter Jackson left school and got a job working as an apprentice photo engraver at a Wellington-based newspaper. But his goal in doing so wasn't so much about independence. It was so he could make movies. See, the film industry in New Zealand at the time, in the late 70s, early 80s, was practically non-existent. So if you wanted to make films, there was really only one road by which to do it. Literally, it was all about believing in yourself. You couldn't look towards a career and becoming a trainee or an apprentice or being a clapper loader or anything. That didn't, those jobs didn't exist because there was no industry. I grew up really feeling that I was going to have to do it myself if I, if I wanted to do it. It's for exactly this reason that I'm completely fascinated by the stories behind directorial debuts. There's so often incredible lessons in just how much you can do with little more than your imagination, and a bunch of friends you've conned into helping you every weekend. Jackson eventually saved enough to buy a second-hand Bolex 16mm camera. It's like a spring-loaded motor. You've got to wind it up, and it gives you about 30 seconds worth of shooting. And in 1983, filming commenced on a 10-minute short with the goal of getting the film into the festival circuit. It was a simple enough story. Jackson's friend Craig Smith played a charity collector sent to a small coastal town who's chased into the woods, captured, killed, and eaten by an alien. Tomorrow we're having you for lunch. It may seem like a far cry from Lord of the Rings, but it was par for the course with Jackson's early interests. Models, miniatures, and visual effects were his entire world growing up. What began with the escapist fantasies of Ray Harryhausen and Jerry Anderson evolved to include the likes of horror icons George Romero and Toby Hooper. And it's not that difficult a line to draw between the two camps. They play to the same fantastical obsessions. Blood and guts and gore has always had a real special draw for young filmmakers. And Jackson's Everton bad taste surely stand amongst the most squirm-inducing. But what really sells it, I think, is his sense of playfulness. None of this is frightening so much as it is wonderfully goofy. It's like watching a particularly bloody audition tape for Monty Python or something. Except it was precisely because of this that everything nearly fell apart, when, halfway through making the short film, Craig Smith announced to Jackson that he was dropping out of the project, because his new wife didn't want her husband participating in some horrid little splatter movie. You could say that she got a bad taste from bad taste. Sorry, I'll see myself out for that one. Jackson shut down production for months until the idea came to retool the existing story away from Smith's character and to center it around a group of commandos sent to the same coastal town to investigate a possible alien invasion. Jackson taking one of the roles and the other three going to friends of his from the newspaper. Problem solved. Now, it should be noted that the term story is to be used fairly loosely, not because bad taste has no story, but because it never had a script. Jackson, who was now not only working full-time Monday through Friday, but also on Saturday so he could afford the expensive 16mm stock and processing fees, would spend virtually all week bored out of his mind, and as a result was constantly dreaming up new things for the crew to film come Sunday. The more footage that they shot, the more ideas he would come up with. And because of that, bad taste grew and grew and grew, and along with it, Jackson's ambitions for what they could accomplish. The final film is a scrappy and charming little splatter fest, but the thing that stands out the most, I think, is Jackson's technical resourcefulness. I mean, the man literally built his own Steadicam for the film. Normally if you buy a proper one, they're about 40 or 50 grand, but this one cost a, about 20 bucks. Move around like this, so it'll come up and down, in and out. And we use it for um, quite a few little shots in bad taste. Prop guns were constructed from aluminum pipes. 
Blood was syrup with red food coloring added in. Guts were nasty looking odds and ends from the butcher shop. But you can learn that from any issue of Fangoria. Jackson went further. Well, the idea with most special effects, I reckon, is to keep them as simple as possible. So you knock something together like this with a bit of cardboard and some ice cream sticks. Nice and slightly like that. <coughs> and there's a pipe for blood. The little holes here that... We use quite a few simple little props like that. It's a puppet. So the mouth goes... <coughs> I just got this great lump of plasticine and started to sculpt. You have to make a plaster of Paris mould and then that has to be filled with foam latex which is like a creamy material that is whisked up in a cake mixer and poured into the moulds, injected into them and then it's got to be baked in the oven. I'd have a menu planned for the meal that night, you know, using the oven and quite often we'd have to end up by having sausages or something under the grill because he'd want the oven for his baking. By this point, the number of characters had grown, but this proved a problem. And then I needed another character and I didn't, I'd, I'd run out of friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I cast myself in a second role. In addition to the nebbish Gryffindor scarf wearing Derek, he played the bearded alien Robert. And this decision led to one of Bad Taste's boldest moments. My friend, the Estro bastard, time for talkies. In which both characters appear in the same scene. <laughs> it's a simple in camera trick, of course, that relies on careful storyboarding, stand ins, and precise editing, but still. A first-time director just simply conceptualizing a scene like this and the time that it must have taken to execute is wildly impressive. Of course, time is what it did take. Three years had passed since Jackson began shooting the original 10-minute film, and by this point he'd spent nearly $11,000 of his own money to finance every bit of the production. With only the climax left to shoot, he rented a small editing machine, sat at his parents' kitchen table, and put together everything he had which, to his surprise, wound up being about 75 minutes of solid usable footage. It was then that two good things happened for bad taste. The first was when Jackson secured a meeting with Jim Booth, the head of the recently established New Zealand Film Commission. Booth was impressed by bad taste, but told Jackson he wouldn't be able to acquire major funding for the film's completion, since it was a splatter movie. However, he could help out, but in a quieter way by awarding Jackson a series of small grants intended for script development, very under the table as it were. As soon as the grant money began arriving, Jackson quit his job at the newspaper and committed full time to finish Bad Taste, even though shooting still took a further eight months to complete since the rest of the cast and crew still worked full time during the week. It was around this time when the second good thing happened. Craig Smith got a divorce. And he wanted to come back into it again, so I said, okay, all right, come back in. And so we, we used him at the very end, and the way that we've edited the film together, it appears like he's sort of in it throughout. Around about the time then that I had finished shooting the movie, I now needed to do post-production on the film, which was going to cost a couple of hundred grand. And Jim said that I had to submit it to the board now, because now was the time where we had to come clean. They gave me money for post-production, and, and the whole thing got finished and taken to the Cannes Film Festival in 1987 or 8. When all was said and done, Peter Jackson had spent four years in production on Bad Taste. I don't think anyone would call it his most sophisticated film, but it's not only a tribute to just how much you can do with so little, but like all directorial debuts, it's a film where you can find ideas and visuals, pieces and threads that are picked up on and expanded in the director's later work. Models and miniatures are inseparable from nearly all of his films since, ditto for all of the spine-tingling bugs, spiders, and monsters. The camera trickery of Jackson fighting himself could be viewed as a precursor to the forced perspective camera work in Lord of the Rings, 
The sheer time commitment of shooting one day a week across four years would be echoed in the years-long process he went through for each of the Middle Earth trilogies. And if nothing else, then Bad Taste in all of its gross-out fun was at least dress rehearsal for his third film, aka the goriest film of all time. Of course, before he got there, he went off and made what you could aptly describe as Sesame Street in Hell. But that's a story for another time. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated online streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Every day they premiere a new film. Whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite you've never seen, or an acclaimed masterpiece, there's always something new to discover. Every film comes lovingly handpicked and curated. And because of that, I found that I end up spending way less time browsing and more time actually watching. It's like your own personal film festival that you can stream anytime, anywhere, on any screen or device. And right now they're offering a great deal. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days by going to mubi.com slash royalocean. 